case you might have missed it, Italy's biggest, richest, and most successful football club, Juventus, have been docked 15 points. It is the latest in a series of setbacks for the Italian giants, who have finished 4th in Serie A in each of the last two seasons, having previously won 9 successive Scudettos, and it comes less than 17 years after Juventus, were relegated for the first time in the history of the club, and stripped of two Serie A titles, as a result of the part that they played in the Calcia Poli scandal. It is also the latest in a series of setbacks for Italian football and the Serie A in general, which has gone from being the pinnacle of European and arguably world football 20 years ago, to being mired in scandal and chaos with crumbling infrastructure, stagnant revenue, and left in the dust not only by the increasingly hegemonic Premier League, but also by La Liga and the Bundesliga. The situation at Juventus is simultaneously very complicated and convoluted, whilst also being very straightforward and easy to understand. And yes, it is possible for something to be both of those things, and I'll explain how. It is complicated and convoluted by multiple separate but parallel investigations conducted by different organisations which have reached different conclusions based upon different evidence and are at different stages. And it is simple and straightforward because some of the primary accusations facing Juventus include things that a lot of people, including people who don't even really follow Italian football, had already long suspected and thought true. Consequently, many Juventus fans are outraged left feeling as though their club is being singled out and hit with a draconian and unjust punishment for the second time in only a couple of decades, operating effectively with a handicap at this stage as victims of their own success, and forced to battle back valiantly and reconquer Italian football time and time again. By contrast, many of those who support Juve's rivals, which, in this context, effectively means every other club in Italian football that isn't Juventus, view Juve as being an inherently corrupt and suspect institution, always willing or trying to bend the rules, and only able to rise time and time again after their latest scandal has been exposed, because they have come up with some new method of malfeasance and underhand tactics. As you can see then, there is quite a lot to unpack. And although plenty has already been written and said about this most recent crisis and the harsher sentence that almost anyone was expecting which has been handed out to the club, including here on YouTube, from what I've seen at least, most of them are pretty light on the details when it comes to shedding light on exactly what the club has actually been accused of doing and why the case is so contentious. Which did simultaneously make this video quite challenging to research, but also made its creation a lot more necessary and worthwhile. Or, you know, I thought so anyway. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to the first Italian capital of Turin, specifically to the prosecutor's office in most cases, for a deep dive into the shenanigans at Juventus, what led us up to this point, and why this can't possibly be the end of it. It's no secret that Serie A, as a whole, has suffered a pretty steep fall from grace over the last 20 years. Even before the league was hit by the Calciopoli scandal, the continental dominance of Serie A was beginning to wane. The All-Italian 2003 Champions League final, which ended in a very Italian 0-0 draw between Juventus and AC Milan, felt like one last hurrah for a league which had been seen as the best in Europe for the preceding two decades. The Premier League was already in the ascendancy, starting to exert its financial might, having broken away from the Football League in 1992 and now enjoying rapid revenue growth, the Bundesliga had modernised and was seeing record attendances, and the Spanish giants of Real Madrid and Barcelona were about to roar back in some style and dominate European football with the help of two of the greatest players of all time. Already by that 2003 Champions League final, Serie A had lost Zinedine Zidane and Ronaldo to Real Madrid, Marcio Amoroso to Borussia Dortmund, and Juan Sebastian Barón to Manchester United. And not long after that, 
Hernan Crespo, Adrian Mutu, and Andrei Shevchenko all joined Chelsea, Walter Samuel was signed by Real Madrid, and Valencia poached Stefano Fiore. Serie A still had some great players, AC Milan, reached the Champions League final in 2005 and in 2007, meanwhile a Mourinho-inspired Inter Milan shot the continent by beating Pep's Barca and Bayern Munich in 2010. But the fact that the latter of those conquests, which is the last European crown that an Italian side has won, came as such a shock was a great illustration of how far Italian football had fallen behind its peers over such a short period of time. The Calciopoli scandal didn't just result in some significant bans and punishments, accelerating the exodus of players, most notably from Juventus, but also from the league more broadly, much more significant than that, it undermined the sense of fairness and competition upon which the sanctity and integrity of sport is built. There are fans who became disillusioned with Syria at that moment, both in Italy and abroad, who have still never returned, or at least not with the same level of interest or investment that they used to have. The 2006 World Cup, in the immediate aftermath of Calciopoli, perhaps gave a false impression of the scale of the crisis that Italian football was facing. Whilst Italy won that World Cup, with an entirely domestic squad, despite not having been among the pre-tournament favourites, beating the host Tunnel in the semis, German football had been revitalised by the tournament, with newly built or renovated stadiums fit for the 21st century, in direct contrast with Italian football's crumbling infrastructure, which created inhospitable and unwelcoming venues, resulting in decades of dwindling crowds. Within all of this darkness then, Juventus were the light. They might not have been liked, or even respected by their rivals, but they were certainly envied. After bouncing back from their enforced relegation in some style at the first attempt, Juventus did something no other Italian football club has ever done, they built their own football stadium, which they own. Juve swapped the massive Stadio della Alpi, which was built for the 1990 World Cup, and was largely despised by locals, for the much smaller but more welcoming, and, crucially, profitable, Juventus Stadium, or Allianz Stadium. The stadium was built at a modest cost, just 155 million euros, and as well as providing the financial rocket fuel required to give Juventus the edge over their rivals, it also seemed to be symbolic of a club that was more forward-thinking than their rivals. The next newest ground in the league, when the Juventus Stadium opened in 2011, had been built between 1971 and 1976. And even now, the next newest stadium in the league is the hardly comparable Marpei Stadium, which opened in 1995. Sure enough, between 2011-12 and 2019-20, Juventus won nine straight Scudettos, a record not just for the club themselves, but for any club in the entire history of Italian football. What's more, whilst all those around them faltered, Juventus became a force to be reckoned with in Europe. They reached two Champions League finals in three seasons, between 2015 and 2017. Meanwhile, no other Italian club reached the final of any European competition between Inter Milan's Champions League win in 2010 and 2019. Juventus also became very shrewd operators within the transfer market, signing the likes of Andrea Perlo, Kingsley Coman, and Sami Kadira on free transfers, and perhaps most notably of all, Paul Pogba, who was signed for a compensation fee of just £800,000 from Manchester United, before being sold back to the Red Devils after four seasons playing in Turin for a world record-breaking £89 million fee. It seemed as though Juve were untouchable throughout much of the 2010s, more dominant than even Bayern Munich in the Bundesliga or PSG in Ligue 1. And yet, since winning the league by just a solitary point in the 2019-20 season, Juventus have finished fourth in each of the last two campaigns, miles behind the champions Inter Milan and AC Milan in each of those two seasons, and hanging on to their Champions League status by a mere thread. 
this season, even prior to their massive 15-point deduction, Juventus were still a whopping 12 points behind Serie A's runaway league leaders Napoli less than halfway through the season. And their points deduction has jettisoned the club all the way down to 10th place in the division. There are lots of different theories or moments that you could pinpoint as being the beginning of Juventus' decline, but certainly a crucial one would seem to be Giuseppe Marotta's departure. Appointed as Juventus' new CEO and general manager in 2010, following eight years at Sampdoria, having taken the club from Genoa from mid-table in Serie B the season before he arrived, to finishing fourth in Serie A and qualifying for the Champions League the season before he left. Sampdoria actually finished above Juventus that season, who finished seventh, in what was only their second season back in Serie A. Marotta brought with him his head of scouting, Fabio Maratici, and his head coach, Luigi Del Neri, from Sampdoria, but whilst the latter lasted just a single season, following a second successive seventh-place finish, Paratici became a hugely influential figure in Turin. Del Neri was replaced by Juventus legend Antonio Conte, a controversial appointment at the time given that he had only just won promotion from Serie B with Siena, and therefore had no experience managing at the highest level. Marotta introduced wholesale changes, refreshing virtually the entire Juventus squad within just two seasons, making several decisions, including the one that I just mentioned, which were unpopular with supporters. Ultimately, though, Marotta's transfer dealings and his appointments of both Antonio Conte and later Massimiliano Allegri proved to be inspired, returning Juventus to the top table of European football. Marotta left Juventus when his contract expired at the start of the 2018-19 season, which he described as being the club's decision rather than his own. In truth, the relationship between the two had become increasingly fractured in the months building up to that point. Marotta was widely reported as having opposed the deal to sign Cristiano Ronaldo from Real Madrid in the summer of 2018, viewing the 100 million euro transfer fee and 93 million euro three-year contract that Juventus had agreed with Ronaldo to be unsustainable and unjustifiable for a player who was already 33 years old and would have little sell-on value. History, it would have to be said, has been quite kind to Marotta's assessment. Within just a few months, Marotta had been appointed as the new CEO at Inter Milan, who won the Serie A title in the 2020-21 season, finishing 13 points above Juventus. Everything changed at Juve after Marotta left. The club didn't officially appoint a new CEO until Maurizio Aravabene got the job in 2021, whose only previous experience in sport came as the team principal of Scuderia Ferrari in Formula One from 2014 to 2019. During the intervening period, Juventus spent a fortune. A transfer outlay of 260 million euros in the 2018-19 season was followed by a further 230 million euro spend in 2019-20, the most notable arrival being Matthias De Ligt for €85 million, Euros, and the spending didn't stop there. On a managerial front, after Massimiliano Allegri's contract was terminated amicably a year early, Juventus, having had just two managers over the preceding eight years, proceeded to rifle through two in as many seasons, namely Maurizio Sarri and Andrea Perlo, before bringing Allegri back in 2021. The context here is important because the Juventus transfers that have been under investigation, initially by Italy's financial regulators, Consob, and later by Italian football's finance watchdog, Covisoc, all occurred from 2018 onwards. The idea, therefore, the Juventus cheated their way to success through financial irregularities is a bit misleading. It would be more accurate to say, if we are to assume for these purposes that Juventus are guilty of all of which they have been accused, that they cheated precisely because they had stopped winning and had ceased to be successful, and they were desperate to get back there. 
Unlike almost every other Italian football club, including AC Milan and Inter Milan, since Silvio Berlusconi and Massimo Moratti's departures, money isn't actually a problem for Juventus. Since 1923, Juventus has been run by the Agnelli family, and they have owned a majority of the club's shares since Juventus became a private limited company in 1949. The Agnelli family, sometimes referred to as the Kennedys of Italy, as the closest thing that Italy has to a royal family these days, are incredibly rich. Giovanni Agnelli, who began the dynasty, was one of the founders of Fiat Motor Company in 1899 and later became the company's chairman. Giovanni was an acquaintance of Benito Mussolini's, appointed as a senator by the fascist dictator, as Fiat became one of Italy's most powerful, influential, and lucrative companies. These days, the Agnelli family are the largest shareholders of Stellantis, the multinational automotive corporation, which owns the likes of Fiat, Chrysler, Citroën, Jeep, Peugeot, Vauxhall, and Opel. And the family has an estimated net worth of $13.5 billion. Giovanni Agnelli's great-grandson, Andrea Agnelli, presided as Juventus president from May 2010 until his recent resignation, along with the rest of the Juventus board. Though it is Giovanni's great-great-grandson, John Elkan, who holds the real power in the family as his grandfather Gianni's chosen heir, and the current chairman of Stellantis. So sourcing money isn't actually a problem for Juventus. Indeed, between 2018 and 2021, to fund their intense spending, there were a series of capital increases and new shares issued by the Agnelli family, injecting several hundred million euros into the club. The problem for Juventus, and indeed, for most European teams with very wealthy benefactors, is skirting UEFA's financial and sustainability regulations. UEFA mandates that teams cannot lose in excess of £53 million over any three-year period. And from 2023-24, they are actually tightening their rules further, limiting investment in transfer fees, agent fees, and wages to 90% of revenue in the 2023-24 season, 80% in 2024-25, and 70% from 2025-26 onwards. Although Juventus are the best supported football club in Italy, with the most profitable stadium and the most commercial revenue, they also have the highest outgoings. Even more significant than that, however, is the overall disparity between Serie A teams and Europe's other top leagues, and particularly the Premier League, in terms of revenue and TV deals. Serie A signed a three-year overseas TV rights deal for the 2021 to 2024 cycle, which is worth $653 million. Compared to the Premier League's overseas TV rights deal, also over a three-year cycle from 2022 to 2025, which is worth $6.55 billion. That's not a small difference, it is 10 times as much. It means that the team that wins the Serie A title, so AC Milan last season, receives less television money than the team that finishes bottom of the Premier League. It's for that reason that a team like Bournemouth, whose stadium can only hold 11,364 fans, are reportedly looking to sign Nicolo Zaniolo from Jose Mourinho's AS Roma at the time of this recording who play their home games at the 70,634 capacity Stadio Olimpico. I have made an entire video entitled, Has the Premier League Broken the Transfer Market? Which is about how the Premier League is already effectively a European Super League, which I will try to remember to leave a link to at the end of this video, should any of you be interested. But the point here being, Juventus, like most European clubs, are fighting a losing battle trying to keep up with the Premier League in terms of finances, and it is for that reason, at least in large part, that the whole Super League proposals were made, with Juventus and Agnelli among its most fervent backers. To combat the league's lack of broadcast revenue, which, it must be said, was partly of their own doing, given that they shot themselves in the foot by imposing such short cycle limits on overseas deals, 
combined with how unprofitable Italian football stadiums are, meaning Serie A sides also tend to drastically underperform their European peers in terms of matchday revenue, the league as a whole has become hyper-dependent upon player sales. In the 2018-19 season, the season in which the investigation began, Serie A teams generated 699 million euros in capital gains via players' sales, which was by far the most of any league in Europe. It was more, incidentally, than Serie A teams actually generated in collective television and commercial revenue that season, putting the league entirely at odds with the Premier League, La Liga, and the Bundesliga on that front. Juventus, given that they were hemorrhaging the most money of any Serie A club, were particularly in need of some extra transfer revenue. Crucially, it must be remembered at this point, as I covered extensively in a recent video about the lengthy contracts that Chelsea are currently handing out and how they plan on navigating FFP restrictions, when a football club signs a player, the fee that they pay is spread out over the term of the player's contract in their accounts, in a process which is known as amortization. When Juventus signed Matthias De Ligt, for example, for 75 million euros from Ajax, that actually only showed up as a 15 million euro expense in their 2019-20 accounts for the season in which they signed him since the cost is spread out over the course of his five-year deal. Of course, De Ligt never actually saw out his entire contract at Juventus and was sold for a small loss to Bayern Munich, but we'll take things one step at a time. The same is not true of when a club sells a player, at which point any profit or capital gain which is made on that sale is immediately recorded in their accounts. So if you wanted to balance the book, so to speak, and make sure that you stayed in line with UEFA financial and sustainability rules, selling players for lucrative fees is a pretty good way to go about it. The problem with selling players, of course, is that selling the good ones tends to make you a worse team, and the bad ones, well, they tend not to be worth much money. The supposed solution that Juventus are accused of coming up with, and the primary offence which has been laid at their door at this stage, is of artificially inflating the transfer fees that they have received in order to boost their profits in the current accounting period when they could be in danger of falling foul of UEFA regulations. Of course, Juventus aren't playing football manager where they could just take over a rival team and spend that club's entire transfer budget on one of their worst players in order to boost their coffers. In the real world, no one actually wants to pay over the odds for a player, and certainly not just to help Juventus pass UEFA's financial regulations. Instead, what Juventus are accused of doing is engaging, effectively, in swap deals, but instead of actually swapping players with another club, with one team perhaps paying a small fee if the player that they were signing was deemed to be the more valuable of the two, as used to be fairly commonplace, the two deals would officially be entirely separate, and both would be greatly and artificially inflated. The example that is most often cited, viewed as somewhat of a smoking gun in this case, is the swap deal which saw Arta Melo join Juventus and Miralem Pjanic head in the opposite direction to Barcelona. I refer to it as a swap deal, but of course, officially that wasn't the case. Juventus paid 72 million euros to sign Arta, meanwhile Barcelona paid 60 million euros for Pjanic. In what was a very rare instance these days of clubs actually revealing the transfer fees involved rather than just saying undisclosed fee. It is in this sense, as I mentioned in the introduction, that this case is very simple. At the time, almost everyone knew, or failing that, instinctively felt since there was no way of knowing for sure, that the fees involved had been inflated and felt unjustifiably large. The focus when those deals happened in 2020 was on Barcelona, who were mired in crisis after crisis at the time, and everyone knew that they were firefighting in an attempt to stave off financial ruin and possible collapse. They had also engaged in a very similar deal which saw Jasper Sillerson join Valencia, and Neto signed for them for potential 35 million and 45 million euro transfer fees in 2019. 
So the suspicion, in public at least, wasn't so much on Juventus at the time, but of course, they were facing equally tricky, albeit less existential financial challenges, and it was a deal which suited both parties. Other deals which potentially could be under investigation and suspicion, though we cannot know for sure yet, but it has been posited, include the exchange deal which saw Joao Cancelo join Manchester City, whilst Danilo headed in the opposite direction, and Leonardo Spinazzola's transfer to Roma during the same summer that Luca Pellegrini left Roma in order to join Juventus. In the same way that everyone knows instinctively that PSG's wage bill, Manchester City's commercial deals being worth more than Real Madrid's, and Barcelona selling their future to pay off enormous existing debts just seems suspect, this was all alleged dodginess that was hiding in plain sight. As far as many people are concerned, there is no doubt that these fees were inflated. The only question mark is whether they broke any rules or whether it was possible to actually prove that that is what was going on. It is on those last two points that this case becomes much more complex and convoluted. The first investigation into Juventus' finances and transfer dealings was made by Italy's financial regulator, Consob. When that became known, another organisation, Covisoc, who are just a financial watchdog within Italian football, referred 62 transfers to the FIGC, Italy's football federation, for them to take a closer look at and determine whether the fees involved had been inflated. Whilst 11 clubs were involved in those 62 transfers, 42 of them concern Juventus, making them by far the most heavily implicated club, should the FIGC find any wrongdoing. In April 2022 though, the FIGC cleared Juventus and the other 10 clubs, reaching a verdict that a player's true value is intangible, subjective, and therefore difficult to determine, and rejecting the prosecution's reliance on player valuations, taken from the German website Transfermarkt. Case closed then. Well, not quite. Otherwise Juventus wouldn't have been docked 15 points. The Chorin prosecutor's office launched their own investigation into Juventus, on suspicion of false accounting and market manipulation, giving them the authority to raid the club's training ground and offices. This investigation is named Prisma, and it is also investigating Juventus's salary deferral at the height of the pandemic. Juventus announced in 2020 that they would be deferring four months' worth of their players' wages, saving the club approximately 90 million euros for that financial year. Prisma alleges that Juventus players only actually had one month of their salaries deferred, which, if true, would make Juventus guilty of having misled markets. There is particular scrutiny of Juventus's financial affairs here because the club is publicly traded, with shares floated on the Borsa Italiana stock exchange, with shares in Juventus, incidentally, not having fared so well historically, down 20% over the last chaotic 12 months, and 75% since they first went public in 2001. Crucially, the Prisma investigation hasn't yet been concluded, which means that its findings haven't yet been heard in front of a court of law, and Juventus maintain that there has been no wrongdoing. It is on the basis, though, of the Prisma investigation, and most notably evidence obtained via wiretaps and the prosecutor's office in Turin, that the FIGC's investigation into the club was formally reopened. The Justitia Sportiva, literally just sports justice in English, is not a court of law, but is an internal court operating as a branch of the Italian Football Federation, effectively like one of the English FA's internal disciplinary panels, which can make judgments within football, but not any actual legal judgments. Slightly unusually, the FIGC and Justizia Sportiva haven't actually said what the wiretapping or other new evidence is that has been obtained or why it convinced them to overturn their initial judgment and dock Juventus 15 points. 
This is a source of significant controversy in Italy, especially given that the prosecution themselves were only arguing in favour of a nine-point deduction, meaning that the panel themselves reached an even more severe conclusion than the one advocated for by the people who brought the case. Juventus have already announced their intention to appeal the judgment, though they are going to await the details of why it was made and on what basis once they have been revealed by the FIGC, which will happen next week. All of this means that the pain may well not yet be over for Juve, since there is still the chore in prosecutor's case against them, which is scheduled to be heard in March and includes extra allegations around salary deferrals. But if they are able to successfully defend themselves in a court of law and are exonerated, that will in turn throw doubt on their 15-point deduction and the bans that have already been issued to several of their former staff and directors, including Fabio Paratici, banned from Italian football for 13 months, who has been the managing director of Tottenham Hotspur since June 2021. It is possible for the FIGC to uphold Juve's deduction and those bans. Governing bodies in sport have different rules and are able to have lower thresholds for a conviction or for a punishment than legal courts, but it would make things really messy. So too would no other clubs receiving any punishment. By its very nature, inflating transfer fees requires two to tango, collusion that is, from a minimum of two separate parties, so if Juventus are the only team punished, they will point to double standards even if the case against them is rock solid. It could be argued that Juventus were guilty on a systemic level, whilst it was just isolated incidents in the case of other clubs, that was one of the reasons why Juve's punishment was so much harsher than anyone else's in the aftermath of Calciopoli, and of course, it is outside the remit of the FIGC to punish the likes of Barcelona and Manchester City if they are guilty of similar wrongdoing. But, you know, you can see how it looks. The entire Juventus board resigned in November 2022. They claim to have done it in the best interests of the club, whilst others perceive it as only proving their guilt. Several, including longtime president Andrea Agnelli, have since been issued with lengthy bans from Italian football. It is reported that Stellantis chairman John Elkan, Agnelli's cousin, pushed him and the other board members to resign, with Elkan becoming more invested in the running of the club and already having installed Maurizio Scanavino as a general director. Given the churn and general sense of tumult at the club, Juventus are more than a little rudderless at this moment in time, not yet having done any January transfer business, at least at the time of this recording. Whatever the outcome of the case against Juventus, and potentially other Italian and European football clubs, and there is simply no way that this is going to be the last that we hear of this story, it is a hammer blow to Italian football. Whilst rival fans may revel in Juve's downfall and argue quite reasonably that it is right that they should be punished for any wrongdoing, it is yet another blow to an already ailing football league and ecosystem. For all of its ills, you feel as though Syria had a unique opportunity in the 2020s. Whilst Europe's other leagues have become increasingly stale and predictable, Serie A has had three different winners over the last three seasons and looks set to make it four from four this season, with Napoli flying and playing arguably the best football of any team in Europe at this moment in time. Instead of capitalising upon that opportunity though, by growing the league's popularity through effective marketing and strategic partnerships, providing the funds for clubs to finally update their woeful stadiums and make the league more competitive, it looks as though virtually no gains will be made. Juventus are in crisis. They have been punished severely and they may yet receive further punishments along with other clubs. AC Milan were recently acquired by a private investment firm based in New York, with that takeover already under investigation by authorities, with their offices having been raided and documents seized. 
Inter Milan are up for sale, with their own crisis-ridden owners Suning Holdings Group, and whilst Napoli's football has been joyous this season, given the plight of Serie A, the likelihood right now it would seem, is that their squad will be picked apart next summer, just as Lille's was following their 2021 league and title win, or Monaco in 2017. And on that bright note, I'll wrap up there and say farewell to you all for now, and goodbye until next time. I hope that you enjoyed today's video, hit the like button if that was the case, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure, of course, it goes without saying that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. You can also follow me on either Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.